Hey guys, what's going on? Mike the Caveman Kuhn here again from Paleo Primal Long Island and MikeTheCaveman.com. And before we get into today's question, I want to first say to all the fathers out there, Happy Father's Day. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy this weather with your family, with your kids. Have a great day. But for today's question, we're going to talk about what is the best alternative to sugar. Now, as you know, I'm very much anti-sugar. I think that we use it way too much that while there is a purpose for it in our bodies, that we seek it out and we use it to replace things way too often and we eat way too much of it. So there are a lot of alternatives out there, non-caloric sweeteners. Now, of course, there are the, the artificial sweeteners and then there are the natural sweeteners. Now, I think you know where I fall on this spectrum. That being said, there is sucralose, which is most commonly seen as Splenda. There is saccharin, which is most commonly seen as sweet and low, though it's not used as much anymore. You'll see it in diners and stuff still. There is acesulfame potassium, or acesulfame K. That's usually added to, well, along with other ones. There is aspartame, which is most commonly seen as either NutraSweet or Equal. And its cousins, which are the newer ones, Neotame and Advitame. Now, all of those have their own unique little issues. The biggest ones, though, are that even though they are non-caloric, they have a role in insulin signal. In fact, they actually have ability to slightly increase insulin. But they're not supposed to. There's no sugar. We're not really entirely sure on how it does so exactly yet. But there has been research showing that non-caloric artificial sweeteners can increase insulin signaling. Okay, it can release insulin. What else? Well, there are terrible effects on the gut microbiome. Ugh. As usual, there is something that's going to tear it apart and it's going to mess with those little critters sitting on in your gut. So, for those reasons, if nothing else, those reasons alone are we reasons to avoid those artificial sweeteners. Now, there are the controversial aspects about whether or not they are linked to neurological and mood disorders. Okay? Aspartame in particular. When it gets broken down, it gets broken down into aspartic acid, phenylalanine, and methanol. Now, the general consensus is that the levels that are being consumed today are not going to reach toxic load. What does that mean? Well, methanol breaks down into formic acid, which is a toxin, but the levels that we are consuming it currently won't reach that threshold, you know, the poisons in the dose. But the thing is, a lot of people who are switching over to these don't understand that it is still a problem. They just hear that the FDA says that it's safe, okay? And that they eat as much as they want because odds are they're not going to reach that. But what if you have somebody who really is truly severely overweight and is addicted to sugar and they're switching to these artificial sweeteners? The potential is still there. It's really just not worth it. One other reason why aspartame in particular can be detrimental is for those who have the condition phenylketonuria, or PKU, which actually my girlfriend Mary Kay does have. The reason why they are unable to break down phenylalanine, which then builds up in the brain because it can't cross the blood-brain barrier. They don't have the necessary enzymes to break it down, and it leads to neurological problems. And yes, while phenylalanine is found in all protein, and you're getting more of it from your normal diet than you would from the aspartame. If someone is eating a lot of protein and consuming lots of aspartame-laden products, you might be getting too much. And even if you're not getting too much where it becomes toxic, even if you have the enzymes to break it down, that amino acid can still build up. You're gonna have competition with the other large neutral amino acids in your brain, like the branched-chain amino acids, tryptophan, as well as its metabolite, tyrosine. So those other amino acids may not be adequate if you're consuming excess amounts of that aspartame in addition to lots of protein. Is it definitive yet? No, but is it worth it? No, because there are other alternatives. So what are the other alternatives? My favorite one is of course stevia. Now stevia is amazing for a number of reasons. One, there is no sugar in it, so there's no caloric value, and it's been shown to improve insulin sensitivity, meaning that your cells become more responsive to that insulin signal and are able to adapt to that blood glucose better. It also has benefits in lowering your blood lipids, you know, LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, but we'll skip over that for now. But yes, it can actually lower it. 
It has some antihypertensive effects. It has antimicrobial, including antiviral effects. And using the leaves or extracts of the leaves, so the whole plant, there's been in vitro or in a lab, in a petri dish, studies of it actually possessing anti-cancer benefit. Now, I actually do make a tea out of stevia leaves I grow in my backyard. I put together some stevia, some peppermint, and some spearmint, and it's a delicious tea, and I'm able to get all those benefits in there. To be clear, though, a lot of the ones you'll see in the store, like the Truvias, those are highly processed. So it is important that you're choosing a stevia that's really close to its natural form, okay? Those leaves, guys, I grow, are probably the best option. But then you find ones that don't have too many other things added to it. If you see other things, that's not the stevia for you. So Truvia, no good. One potential cause of concern for the stevia, though, is that if you have ragweed allergies, you may want to avoid it as it is closely related, they are cousins botanically, and it may result in a similar allergic reaction. So if you have ragweed allergies, that's the only time I'd say to avoid stevia. Otherwise, that's still my number one go-to. What else is an option? Well, there is Lohan Guao or monk fruit. It's a Chinese herb, similar to stevia. It doesn't have a caloric value. It does not raise insulin. In fact, it actually has some insulin sensitivity signaling benefits. It has also been used traditionally in Chinese medicine for coughs and sore throats. So it actually has some potential medicinal value. So those two, stevia and lohang guao, are my two absolute favorites. The next list is xylitol. Now xylitol is a sugar alcohol. Similarly, you have erythritol, you have mannitol, and you have sorbitol. Those three, I'm not as crazy about, but I'm okay with them being in a product with something else. So if they're there with stevia, I'm okay with it. If that's the only one we're looking at, eh, not as crazy. Xylitol, though, has some benefits regarding tooth health. That's why lately, if you look into like a lot of gums and toothpaste, you'll see Xylitol being added to it because there is some benefit there in dental health. So Xylitol is awesome. The one problem with those sugar alcohols, though, is that they are, by definition, polyols. Where did we talk about that before? With those FODMAPs, okay? So if you have some gut intestinal issues, if you are sensitive to FODMAPs, well, those sugar alcohols probably aren't best for you. And there is, in fact, some evidence for digestive upset regarding the use of sugar alcohols in excessive amounts. So of them, your best choice is to stay with that stevia, that lohan guao, you know, that monk fruit, add in a little bit of xylitol, and those are your best options. Your absolute best option, of course, is to avoid them all together for the most part. But realistically, we're still human, right? We like sweet things. We're designed to like sweet things. They are delicious. So using treats, let's be very clear on this. We're talking about cheats, we're talking about treats. Using foods that are similar to what you used to eat can be a good idea as an occasional treat. There's no psychological stigma of, oh no, I broke my diet, okay? Don't use cheat meals, use treats. Just because something can be eaten doesn't mean it should be eaten every day. The bulk of your diet should be, again, wait for it, real food. Then you can use a little bit of those stevia sweetened, a little bit of those xylitol, or those monk fruit sweetened treats. Get it? So treats don't have a stigma. You didn't fail. You didn't break. So as an example, let's say my keto pancake recipe. You can make that, you can add some vanilla stevia to it along with some cinnamon, and then you get the double insulin sensitivity boost, and you get to have pancakes. It tastes amazing. It is a treat. It's not going to break your diet, and you get to feel like a human again, right? Because the crazy part is, even though eating real food should be the way you feel, we are so hardwired as a culture that, no, these are foods. You know, our pizza, our pasta, our pancakes, our bagels, all that. That's the food. No, that's not food. Food. It's out here. It's everywhere. That is food. Either way, when it comes to those sweeteners, use real ones. Use plants that taste like sugar but aren't necessarily actually sugar. Don't go with the artificial, the man-made ones, okay? Okay, guys, hopefully that helped you out a little bit. And you like this video, you know what to do, though. Like and subscribe down below. Share it with your friends. Head on over to Instagram and Twitter and follow me at Mike the Caveman. Head on over to Facebook over at Paleo Prime on Long Island and, of course, over at MikeTheCaveman.com. That being said, guys, enjoy this wonderful Father's Day. 
take care of your fathers, maybe make them a treat. That being said, I'll see you tomorrow, guys. Have a good day.